All right, welcome back. And today, guys, we are going to finish up our lecture series on reconstruction. We're going to talk about how it all ends. But before we get to the terrible collapse, uh, let's talk about some of the good, uh, some of the brief shining moments of Reconstruction, which is, of course, when you had, directly after the Civil War, astonishingly as it was, thousands of African Americans exercising political rights, actually uh, holding office and uh, making some radical changes happen during this era of congressional Reconstruction, when radical Republicans in Congress had taken back over. Um, a lot of African Americans in the South, these newly freed individuals, they're going to be uh, by the thousands joining what was called the Union League, um, which was very closely linked to the Republican Party. And a lot of uh, freedmen, they would become representatives of the League, helping to uh, register Black voters in the South. Because uh, remember, the Republican Party desperately needs African Americans to be able to vote. That was a major impetus behind the ratification of the 15th Amendment that guaranteed uh, suffrage to um, men of all colors, because Republicans need to basically keep power. Um, and the, they're not going to be getting any or, or hardly any white support from the South. So uh, that's why they needed to make sure that Blacks could vote. Um, so the Union League will be part of that effort. And um, keep in mind, yeah, women, women cannot vote, women of any colors. Uh, women will not be able to vote until the 19th Amendment passes. This is uh, like 50 years later. Uh, if the 15th Amendment passed around 1870, 1871, the, the 19th Amendment that will grant um, suffrage to all women of all colors uh, won't pass until 1920. Uh, so it's a long time away. But by 1870, uh, because of the 15th Amendment, uh, nearly all the former Confederate states, uh, also because of the, the Reconstruction Act and, and radical Republicans' mandates, uh, nearly all the former Confederate states of the South had been readmitted to the country. And in a region where the Republican Party had not existed before the war, remember that in the 1860 election, Lincoln's name didn't even appear on the ballot. Um, nearly all of these Southern states now by 1870 are under Republican control, thanks to newly enfranchised African Americans. Um, their new state constitutions drafted under radical control uh, by Congress in 1868 and 1869. So remember, they had, to, they had to create new state constitutions. That means a new state government under Johnson's Reconstruction Plan. And then those were scrapped when Congress took the reins over. And then they had to create a second new, they had to scrap the first plan, and they had to create a second new state constitution under the radicals provisions, which meant ratification not only of emancipation, the 13th Amendment, but also the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, which granted African American citizenship and full rights and protections under the law, and the 15th Amendment guaranteeing suffrage for men of all colors. Um, so these new, uh, these new state constitutions that the South has, um, they're pretty they're pretty landmark, like they're pretty significant. It's the first public bodies in the history of our country that had substantial black representation ever. Um, and it's a considerable improvement over the Johnson governments that they'd replaced that had looked exactly like the Confederate or the antebellum governments. Um, and these new constitutions under the radical governments, uh, they greatly expanded public responsibilities. They established the South's first state-funded systems of public school. Remember, the South had lagged behind in public education, far behind the North. Remember Hor uh, Horace Mann um, and the, the beginning of common schools that all began in the North and like Massachusetts. Uh, the North was far ahead in educating its you know, having universal public education for, for everybody to try to get a, a literate, um, product, productive society and a diverse economy. The South did not have a diverse economy and they, they purposely kept many people in the dark, not just African Americans who it was illegal to teach literacy, but also many poor whites uh, were purposely kept uneducated to keep that Southern system in check. 
Um, these new uh, these new governments, though, so they have public education going for the first time in the South. They also created new penitentiaaries, um, orphans, orphanages, asylums, and um, and all sorts of new public uh, public spheres. These new constitutions also guaranteed equality of civil and political rights and abolished practices of the antebellum. By the way, when I say antebellum, I mean like before the war. That's what it literally means. So we're talking about like the, the old deep south, the southern way of life before the civil war. Okay, that's the antebellum era. Um, so these new governments abolished antebellum practices such as whippings as a punishment for a crime. You can't do that anymore. Property qualifications for office holding and imprisonment for debt trying to, again, undo those black coats we talked about. Um, a few states even initially barred or exempted former Confederates from being able to vote, but this policy was quickly abandoned by the new state governments because that was just way too many people. So this brings us to the nearly 2,000 plus um, African Americans who are going to hold public office during Reconstruction times. Um, there were about 14 um, African Americans during Reconstruction who were elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in Congress. Uh, there were two pictured here that are actually going to be elected to the United States Senate during Reconstruction, Hiram Revels being the first and Blanc K. Bruce being the second, um, both elected from uh, the state of Mississippi. Uh, you also had uh, at the state and local levels, the presence of black office holders and their white allies uh, making a real difference in Southern life, um, ensuring that blacks accused of crimes would be tried before juries of their peers um, and enforcing fairness in such aspects of local government as road repair, tax assessment and poor relief. In South Carolina and Louisiana, the homes of the South's wealthiest and best educated free black communities, most of the prominent reconstruction um, like African Americans who held office, they had never experienced slavery. Um, in addition, a number of black reconstruction officials such as uh, Jonathan J. Wright, who served on the South Carolina Supreme Court, uh, had come from the North. But most of these African Americans who are gonna hold office during reconstruction, they had been slaves. And it's remarkable that these people who had been born slaves uh, are now freed and now able to literally be in control of their, their city governments, their state governments, even um, in the National Congress for the United States of America um, in the same generation, in the same lifespan. It was, it was breathtaking, like the, the amount of change that was happening for these people. Um, but bear in mind, grain of salt, right? it's not going to last. That's the tragedy of reconstruction. It's not going to last. Um, all right. So remember Hiram Revels, the first ever African-American Senator. Why is this not going? There we go. Okay. Carpet baggers and scalawags. Um, so a carpet bagger was a northerner who migrated to the south during reconstruction. Um, if you were a carpet bagger, it's kind of a ridiculed name that southerners gave for these northerners. They're trying to say that uh, they packed up, there's literally a carpet bag right there, that they packed up their stuff in the north so quickly, you know, they just rolled it into a carpet because they were so frantic to get down into the south and take advantage as quickly as they possibly could. Um, of the situation of the, the war-torn South. And so that was where that name Carpetbaggers originated from. I wonder if it's doing that again. Oh, well, we'll find out later. Um, now for, uh, for the, and these Carpetbaggers, they are Republicans, by the way, that are coming down from the North to the South, getting jobs in the South, uh, starting businesses in the South after the Civil War. Um, some of them were corrupt, you know, seeking to take advantage of the situation, you know, overcharging for things because the South was so depleted and its resources were so stripped. But most of the, the carpetbaggers, most of the white Republicans who came down into the South, many of them were like from the Freedmen's Bureau, or many of them also were actually like Union soldiers who had decided to stay in the region after the war was over. 
Um, now, scalawags, you're a scalawag, sir. Um, these were even worse than the carpetbaggers. If you were a true Southerner, true Southerner, um, then a scalawag was one of your own kind that had turned traitor. Um, and the way that they had turned traitor, one of your own Southern white you know, people that was a traitor, was by supporting the Republican Party and supporting Congress's reconstruction plans. So Republicans that were from the South, they were the scalawags. They were the ones that were um, going along with African-American civil rights with the 14th and 15th Amendments. Um, they were seen as the true traitors to their kind. Um, so there is a lot of changes happening. You don't have any Democrats really being elected uh, during this congressional period of reconstruction. And so the Republican governments in these states and the Republican uh, controlled Congress are going to be doing a lot of these big government things that we've seen. Remember the Republican party has some vestiges from the Whigs, which had vestiges from the Federalist. They're about big government. They're about like Henry Clay's old American system. They're about having a centralized financial banking authority. They're about tariffs to protect American industry and businesses and factories. Um, they're about expanding infrastructure, including canals, railroads, roads, highways, um, utilities like uh, the telegraph wires, modernizing hospitals and prisons, um, doing all sorts of big government things that do require a lot of taxation. And um, like I mentioned, the South is gonna be undergoing tremendous transformation. Um, because as we already saw, that land is not going to be the way that uh, Republicans are going to try to assist African Americans. That already fell apart when Johnson gave back the land to the Southern whites. So if land isn't going to be the ticket for transforming the South's economy and getting it back on its feet, then they were hoping to diversify the Southern economy that for so long had rested on agriculture. They're gonna try to diversify it so it could look more like the Northern economy that would have you know, a mix of manufacturing and merchants and agriculture and all sorts of stuff instead of just relying on like cash crops such as cotton and tobacco. Um, so perhaps the greatest achievement of what they were able to do was you know, all of these big government things. And I think the greatest, because, you know, I'm a teacher, so I'm obviously biased, was in their state-funded public education systems throughout the South. This is the first time you have public education uh, in the South. Because remember, before it had been the, the rich planter class, they would pay for private tutors for their, their children, uh, the, the, the Southern aristocracy. And then when they're young men reached of age, they would probably ship them off over to Europe to fancy schools in England or in France uh, to get their formal education. And then if you were, if you were a poor white, uh, then you really didn't have much access to education at all. Um, and if you were a, an African American, it was literally illegal to teach you how to read or write. So um, creating a public school system for every Southern child, that was a huge deal that did begin uh, finally, uh, under this Reconstruction era. So that's a, that's a big accomplishment for these Republican governments in the South. Um, now, they were still segregated. So um, even under Reconstruction, most of the public schools that were set up, even during this era, um, they did not allow black and white children to mix. Um, I think the only exception was in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, that was the only public school system that was integrated. And only in South Carolina did the uh, the state university there admit black students. Otherwise, it was uh, you know blacks only colleges and whites only colleges. Now, of course, after Reconstruction, when we get into the Jim Crow era, that is the era of racial segregation. Everything is going to be legally separated in the South. Okay, but again, Reconstruction, brief shining window. Things were possible from the late 1860s to the early 1870s. It was a very very small window. Um, the new governments also pioneered civil rights legislation. They made laws that uh, made it illegal for railroads, hotels, and other institutions to discriminate on the basis of race, which will eventually be codified into the Civil Rights Act of 
1875, uh, but again, this will all be torn down during the Jim Crow era. Um, and they passed laws to ensure that agricultural laborers and sharecroppers had the first claim on harvested crops rather than merchants to whom the landowner owed money. South Carolina even created a state land commission, which by 1876 had settled some 14,000 African-American families and a few poor whites on their farms. So there were some good things happening. It's just not going to be staying around. And now is where we start talking about how all of this comes crashing down, how it's temporary. Um, many of the Southern whites, Democrats, uh, derided the Reconstruction Republican governments that were created by Congress in the South as extremely corrupt. And certainly corruption did exist like during Reconstruction in big ways, but it wasn't confined to any one race, region, or party. Like a lot of Southern whites accused these Reconstruction governments, they called them black governments, um, where you had African Americans holding office, they accused them of being incompetent and, you know, uh, being extremely corrupt where they would, you know, take bribes and they would embezzle money and do all sorts of evil, you know, terrible things because these African Americans had no values and whatnot. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't restricted to any one group or region. In fact, some of the worst corruption was actually in the North, um, like the whiskey ring uh, under President Grant and uh, the tweed ring uh, in New York City. That was, that was this uh, political machine organization known as Tammany Hall. Um, and that was actually uh, ran by the Democrats in New York City, uh, the Irish Democrats. Most opposition to reconstruction, it wasn't, it wasn't about the corruption. It wasn't even about the higher taxes that Republican governments were instituting to pay for all of those new public services. It was about racism. Um, it was about the fact that white Southerners could not accept the idea of former slaves being able to vote, holding office, and enjoying equality before the law. And this is why they're going to launch a campaign of violence in an effort to end this Republican rule where Blacks had rights and were able to hold office. Um, real quickly, before we talk about that, though, um, understand political machines, okay? Uh, a political machine is where you have a group of people, think like a gang almost, um, controlling a city. And uh, they have a political boss, like a gang boss that's running the show and how it will control the city, the local government, the, the city government, is the political machine, the, the henchmen of the boss will go out and recruit voters among the immigrant population. Because major northern cities like New York City, where this big T Tammany Hall ring, uh, where they're doing their thing, they uh, have enormous influxes of immigration, especially by the, the late 1800s. So if you can control the way immigrants vote, you can control the city government, and that's what they did. Um, they would recruit these immigrant voters by basically promising them uh, jobs. They would promise them you know, jobs in the factories owned by the boss. They would promise them also uh, affordable living in what was known as a tenement, very, very like poor housing. Uh, but for a lot of these immigrants who came with nothing but the clothes on their backs, this was a lot, and they were incredibly grateful. And um, this was how they secured this loyalty. And so they secured this vote from all these, these immigrants. Um, and the boss, like William Tweed, the, the guy who ran Tammany Hall, the political machine in New York City, he didn't need for these immigrants to vote for him as the mayor of New York City. Instead, through you know, the spoil system, uh, what we talked about before, like under Andrew Jackson, the system of patronage, uh, Tweed would instead have his top lieutenants, his henchmen and his gang hierarchy, he would reward them by having them voted to the leaders of the city government and the leaders of the police force and whatnot. Um, so rewarding loyal followers, remember that's the spoil system. And then um, using their new positions of authority, his followers would then make sure that Tweed got the best deals on all of his businesses and factories and apartments and everything else that he owned and controlled. 
his contract companies would get all of the the new construction jobs for the city government. They need to build a new library. Well, there you go. We'll we'll use Tweed's contracting uh, firm and uh, his construction companies. They would they would embezzle out the wazoo. Graft was incredibly, incredibly widespread. So um, they would make millions, tens of millions of dollars and in 1860s, 1870s money. This is, I can't, I don't have an inflation calculator in my head, of course, but like hundred, at least hundreds of millions of dollars by today's money that he was able to steal from the, the city government in this way. Like building a, uh, the the Library of New York City, um, Tweet's company would charge, you know, $5,000 for every door, uh, $2,000 for every chair, um, a new bookcase, you know, for the library, every bookcase, you know, $50,000. Like it was, it was crazy amount of graft that was going on. Um, but that was, that is corruption, okay? Doing, uh, taking advantage of uh, public office and public trust um, and then using it for your own gain. That is the definition of corruption. And that was very widespread. It wasn't just among uh, carpetbaggers um, or the, the newly elected um, Republicans, white Republicans or, or black Republicans in, in positions of Southern leadership. It was in the North. It was in political machines that ran northern cities. It was in the very administration of the, the presidents of the United States, uh, which we'll talk about all the corruption under Grant's administration uh, with the credit mobile scandal, the whiskey ring, um, and more. But uh, corruption was very widespread. The biggest complaint, like I said, that Southerners really had came from racism. And so this led to the reign of terror um, and the beginning of uh, what we'll see becomes the Jim Crow South, the end of Reconstruction. Now, immediately following the Civil War, um, there was there was still violence, but it was localized. It wasn't very organized. There were many um, there were many Southern whites, obviously, who refused to accept the outcome of the war and who resisted um, in in forms of like guerrilla warfare and whatnot. I don't want to, I don't want my face to be anywhere near any of that stuff. Let's just do that. Okay. Uh, it's pretty bad. Um, but yeah, a lot of this, this early violence against African Americans who were newly freed, uh, like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't very organized. Blacks would be assaulted, sometimes even murdered for refusing to give way to whites on city sidewalks in the South using language that Southerners referred to as insolent, um, you know, if they talked back basically, or challenging end of year contract settlements and vagrancy laws, or attempting, for African Americans attempting to buy land. Um, there was violence, uh, is, you know, before the Civil War had even ended that, that persisted in all of those cases. But the violence that greeted the, the beginning of the Republican governments after 1867 was far more pervasive and more directly motivated by politics. So it's not just going to be targeting African Americans who are newly freed, it will also be targeting white Republicans in the South. In wide areas of the South, secret societies sprang up with the aim of preventing Blacks from being able to vote and destroying organizations of the Republican Party by assassinating local Republican leaders and public office holders. And this is where you get the beginning of the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK. Um, the, the Klan uh, originated with a former Confederate general. Um, his picture is there on the... Uh, left side of the screen. His name was Nathan Bedford Forrest, and this was in Tennessee. Um, in 1866, the Klan originated. And the original Klan, they kind of served as the military, and really they were, they were a terrorist organization uh, aimed at spreading fear and terror, but the military arm of the Southern Democratic Party. Um, they they targeted Republican leaders, black and white. Uh, I mean, you guys probably have heard about the Klan before, but um, a lot of their tactics originated at this time, following immediately after the Civil War. They would uh, commit their acts of terror, basically, by targeting African Americans, usually, um, doing lynchings where they would hang them in a public place by a branch, 
um, and leave their body so everyone could see what would happen to those who talked back or tried to uh, resist the norms of Southern society and go along with these new reforms that were taking place. Uh, burning crosses and stuff, the, the Ku Klux Klan sees themselves as uh, safeguarding Southern white culture and white women, and they see themselves as a Christian organization. Um, the term WASP is usually applied to the Klan for those who uh, make up its membership. So if you were a Klansman, chances were, if you were a Klansman, you were probably white, you were probably of Anglo-Saxon descent, which means of like British descent, um, and you were a Protestant Christian, you were not Catholic. Um, and we'll see later resurgences of the Klan, um, for instance, in the 19-teens and 1920s that expand their terrorism, their, their acts of violence against other groups besides just, you know, reform-minded radical Republicans and African Americans. They will later, um, in the second resurgence of the Klan, target new groups such as Jews and Catholics and immigrants. But the original Klan was meant to oppress African Americans, to keep them in line, to keep them from basically exercising any of the new rights that were trying to be guaranteed to them during this Reconstruction era. Uh, the bloodiest act of violence during Reconstruction, probably, uh, took place in Colfax, Louisiana in 1873, where you had armed whites assaulting the town with a small cannon um, that, was, that had been used during the Civil War. Hundreds of former slaves were murdered, including 50 members of the Black Militia Unit after they had already surrendered. Um, they took them down by the river and they shot each one of them and uh, dumped their bodies into the water. Um, and these were people who had already surrendered. Many of the, um, the black militia unit had been uh, African Americans who had served in the Union Army during the Civil War. And this was over like the elections and who would get to basically be the, the local city government there. Um, that's where they were camped out around the, the courthouse of the town. That's just one incidence. There were dozens of these massacres that took place across many southern cities um, and, and some northern cities. You also had violence and it wasn't just the Klan. There were other groups like the Klan, like the Knights of the White Circle in Louisiana and stuff uh, that were promoting violence against African Americans to keep them oppressed, to keep them from exercising their rights, from keep, to keep them from being able to vote. Um, but a lot of the violence was also economically motivated. Now that African Americans were free to pursue their own uh, wage labor, uh, they came into conflict with many poor whites who now were competing against them for jobs. Um, and this led to violence in many cities and many riots. In response to all of this violence that is going on, the acts of terror and widespread uh, not following of the 14th and 15th Amendments, Congress is going to adopt three enforcement acts throughout 1870 and 1871, which outlawed terrorist societies and allowed President Grant, remember former Union General Ulysses S. Grant, to use the army against these terrorist groups like the Klan. Uh, these laws continued uh, the expansion of national authority during Reconstruction. Remember from the Reconstruction Act, the South was already divided into military districts, five military districts that were supposed to be under martial law. This gave Grant the authority to literally send in the army um, and hunt down these, these terrorists. And in 1871, that is exactly what Grant does. He dispatched uh, numerous federal marshals backed up by troops in some areas to arrest hundreds of accused Klansmen. Many Klan leaders fled the South, and after a series of well-publicized trials and arrests and imprisonments, the first Klan kind of went out of existence, at least publicly. Um, so in 1872, for the first time since the Civil War, peace sort of reigned across most of the South. A lot of people find that really surprising, but the Klan actually ended uh, after the Enforcement Acts. But yeah, the the first Klan had to go underground. They, they basically ended their public reign of terror uh, because Grant sent in the military after them and it became too hot to be a Klansman. 
But like I said, we know they're still around today and there's numerous other white supremacist groups out there today, like the Proud Boys and, and uh, QAnon and all these, these other groups that I'm not even gonna go there. Uh, but uh, they will come back basically, that's what happens. Uh, like I said, the, the Klan itself, the KKK, they'll be back uh, by the 19 teens and 1920s, expanding their hate. Um, so they go underground, but they will be back. Okay. Um, so the Supreme Court is also going to be doing its part to help end Reconstruction. Remember, Supreme Court justices serve for life, for the good and bad. Um, and so a lot of these Supreme Court justices had been formerly appointed decades before by slaveholding presidents like Andrew Jackson. We talked about Roger B. Taney with the the famous uh, Dred Scott decision. Um, and so the Supreme Court will be dismantling Reconstruction. Um, in the Slaughterhouse cases in 1873, the justices ruled that the 14th Amendment had not altered traditional federalism. Most of this, uh, most of the rights of citizens, it declared, remained under state control. Um, so remember that the 14th Amendment asserted that every person born in the United States is a citizen entitled to equal protection under the law as all other citizens, regardless of race or national origin. Um, so basically saying you have to give civil rights to African Americans. Um, and it, it basically forced the states to do this. It said that a state cannot discriminate against a person for their race. Um, they have to treat everybody, regardless, um, as a citizen. Um, but what the slaughterhouse cases did is they said that um, states can still discriminate, um, that it's only the national government that can't. Um, it undid that, that part of the 14th Amendment. Um, so that was a huge step back, basically allowing state governments to uh, reinstitute some oppressive rules of the black codes, which will morph into Jim Crow laws, which again are those laws of racial segregation. So the slaughterhouse cases dismantle a very important part of the enforcement of the 14th Amendment. In the uh, United States versus Cruikshank case, uh, three years after that, in 1876, the Supreme Court basically ended the enforcement acts um, by throwing out the convictions of some of those Southern whites who had been directly responsible for the Colfax massacre of 1873. So enforcement acts no longer really got any teeth. Uh, the national government won't be able to send in the marshals and the military to stop the democratic terrorism that was going on throughout the South. So these, these were ways the Supreme Court was undoing reconstruction. Um, okay, for the 1870, this is Grant's re-election, so this is 1872, 1872 presidential election. Grant is going to face a uh, challenge from uh, the Democrats. Um, is it from, no, sorry. Uh, the Democrats aren't really going to have a big challenge for Grant in 1872. It's going to be from a new group actually called the Liberal Republicans. Yeah. Um, now, these were not the radicals who believed in abolition, who we talked about with like Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens. Um, liberal Republicans are more like the, remember we talked about the three different memories of Reconstruction, the reconciliationist view, the white supremacist view, the abolitionist view. These liberal Republicans would be more in line with the reconciliationist view. They don't really care about African American rights. Um, they believe that um, the South should kind of be able to solve its own problems without constant interference from Washington. That the federal government had already freed the slaves with the 13th Amendment, had already made them citizens with the 14th Amendment, and had given them the right to vote, at least for the men, with the 15th Amendment. Now, these liberal Republicans said Blacks should rely on their own resources, not demand further assistance from the national government, who they argued was already being stretched too thin. So um, an influential group of these Republicans get together to basically create the liberal Republicans. 
um, to, to go against the Grant administration. And to be fair, there were a lot of truthful accusations of corruption against Grant. Um, Grant has a lot of his, Grant was not a politician, he becomes president, and a lot of the people that he places in his cabinet and in positions in the White House under him will be taking advantage of their power and doing enormous, enormous corruption. Um, and so liberal Republicans are wanting to end the corruption and they're wanting to uh, kind of curtail the power of their own Republican party. They see it as being way too wasteful, way too corrupt. And so they appealed to a lot of the Democrats, um, these, these liberal Republicans. Uh, they included founders like Lyman Trumbull and prominent editors of uh, huge newspapers, such as Horace Greeley, who they actually nominate to run for president uh, against Grant in 1872. Now, Greeley um, is going to lose huge because even though Democrats kind of supported a lot of what liberal Republicans were talking about, which would be an end to Reconstruction, which they were like, heck yeah, let's end this stuff and get back to that old Southern way of life that we enjoyed. Um, they still couldn't like quite stomach as Democrats voting for a Republican, even a liberal Republican such as Horace Greeley. Um, and so Grant wins uh, in 1872, but it's opening up the door that, uh, hey, not all is, is right, even in the Republican Party. And then you have a economic depression. And this is like where uh, Bill Clinton in the 1992 presidential election, he famously had a sign um, in, his, in his campaign war room that said, it's the economy, stupid. Like, Hey, what do people care about? What what is what what really matters to voters? It's the economy, stupid. That's that's what the sign literally said. And what that means is that you know people are going to be happy with their government as long as they're doing well themselves. As long as you have a job and you are thriving and prospering, you got money and you got food on your table and a roof over your head for you and your family, you're probably going to be pretty happy. But when you start to struggle financially, um, and you start to, you know, not be able to provide those things, that's when you're going to be upset. Um, and that's when the status quo of our politics will change because people will necessitate a change. Um, and so this, this becomes a really big deal, this panic of, of 1873. It was caused by a variety of factors. You don't really need to remember any of these specifically because we got a lot of other panics uh, we're going to be talking about. And then the really big one, the Great Depression of the 1930s, you're definitely going to need to know about. But for this panic of 1873, um, it was triggered by industrial output exceeding demand. That's called overproduction. When you have too much of something, the price drops. There were these giant fires that destroyed most of the entire cities of uh, Boston and Chicago. Famously, the Chicago fire, there was a rumor that it was started, literally, this is the one you might have heard of before, where like a cow tipped over a bucket when they were milking it, and then like the lantern that the farmer had like tipped over, and then the barn caught fire, and then the whole city caught fire and burned down because of this one farmer's cow. No, I don't know if the cow survived. Don't ask me. <laughs> Students have asked that before. Um, but and, uh, and as always, like we talked about the previous uh, panics of 1817 and, and 1837 and stuff, uh, speculative investments uh, on land out west, that's, that's always been a common denominator. Um, the, the Coinage Act of 1873 also kind of um, put into uncertainty our, our money supply. It uh, ended by metallism, taking silver off of our, our money's uh, standard. By, by standard, I mean like what money used to be based on. Because today we just have fiat or paper money where it's not based on anything except for the value that we give it saying, hey, here, let me buy some bread. Please take this money. And then they take your money and it's all good because we all believe in that paper money. They didn't used to just do that. That was That was seen as, you know, not you wouldn't trust that paper money because it wasn't backed by anything so they used to have gold actually backing up money um and during the the civil war we got off of it briefly with those greenbacks we talked about the greenbacks which was paper money for the first time not backed up by anything um but there was a there's gonna be a huge debate in the late 1870s about what should our new money be based off of 
Uh, should it be based off of silver, which there is more of than gold, or should it be based off of a combination of the two, gold and silver, which is known as bimetallism or two metals? Um, or should it just be based on gold, which is the standard that most countries back in the day used? Gold is the standard, gold standard. Um, and so we switched off during uh, 1873 from uh, silver uh, just to gold. So we are gonna be on the gold standard. Um, so because of this economic depression, Democrats are gonna see big gains in the 1874 midterm elections. And uh, it's actually gonna lead to uh, Democrats controlling the House of Representatives for the first time since the Civil War. Now, in their lame duck session, that's between the November elections and when the new Congress would be sworn in in the following January, the outgoing radical Republicans do one last push for civil rights to try to secure some foothold uh, for equality for African Americans. And that was when they passed that Civil Rights Act of 1875, uh, which formally was supposed to outlaw racial discrimination in places of public accommodation, restaurants and um, hotels and, and such like that. It's not going to last though, because remember we already talked about the dismantling of the 14th Amendment here. Um, by the state governments that this becomes allowable state governments can bypass the 14th amendment and so this civil rights act of 1875 it's going to be in the books but it's really not going to help the situation that will develop as we get into jim crow era and this brings us to the redeemers by the mid-1870s, Reconstruction was clearly on the defensive. It was starting to fade. Democrats had already recontrolled, uh, regained control of the states um, with substantial white voting majorities in Tennessee, North Carolina, and Texas. Um, and these victorious Democrats, they would call themselves the Redeemers, since they claimed to have redeemed the white South from corruption of those carpetbaggers and Republican black governments, the misgovernments um, and uh, of the Northern and black control. So these were the redeemers, these new white supremacist, uh, formerly Confederate state governments that are taking back control. Um, in those states where Reconstruction governments survived, violence uh, erupted. Um, and this time, uh, the Grant administration showed no desire to intervene, and plus it really kind of can't after the Crookshank cases. Um, so the enforcement acts aren't going to matter. In Mississippi in 1875, for instance, armed Democrats destroyed ballot boxes and drove former slaves from the polls, not allowing them to vote. And this is not the only instance where this is going to happen. Similar events like this also took place in South Carolina in 1876. And this kind of sets the stage for the presidential election of 1876, um, where you have voter intimidation by groups sort of like the Klan happening throughout the South. Um, and you have Reconstruction governments only existing in just a few Southern states. Um, so the states where you still had uh, Reconstruction Republican control uh, in the South were only South Carolina, right here. Uh, you had Florida, right here. And can you guess what the last one is? Look at this. Look at the South here on the map. See, it's all blue. Blue is the Democrats, and then there's just South Carolina, Florida, and there's the third one, Louisiana. So those were the only ones that still had Reconstruction governments by this point. Um, to succeed Grant, Grant's already served his two terms, Republicans nominate the governor of Ohio, a guy with a terrible name, as a lot of presidents in the late 1800s seem to have. Uh, his name was Rutherford B. Hayes. Rutherford. The Democrats chose um, New York's governor, Samuel J. Tilden, a Northern Democrat, as their choice. Um, and by this time, like I said, only those three states in the South still had Republican control, but it was very fragile. Um, all the other Southern states had already been taken back over control by the Redeemers, those Southern white Democrats. The election of 1876 between Hayes and Tilden turned out to be so close that whoever captured those three Southern states would basically become the next president. 
Does that sound familiar? That it all comes down to just a few swing states. Unable to resolve this impasse on its own, Congress in January of 1877 appointed a 15 member electoral commission. Um, and Republicans enjoyed an eight to seven majority on the commission. And to nobody's surprise, they decide by that same margin, eight to seven, that Hayes would become the president of the United States. Now, obviously, Democrats were outraged. They said that the election was stolen, hashtag not my president, all that stuff going on again. It could have been civil war part two, okay? Everybody's freaking out. So even as the commission deliberated, there were behind the scenes negotiations taking place between the leaders of the two parties. And Hayes representatives are basically going to agree to recognize democratic control of the entire South to avoid further intervention in local affairs um, and to avoid further intervention in local affairs. Uh, for their part, Democrats promised not to dispute Hayes's right to be the president and to promised, cross their hearts and hope to die, promised to respect the civil and political rights of African Americans. Yes, they're not going to do that. Uh, thus, that concluded the bargain of 1877. Okay, remember we talked about the corrupt bargain of 1824? Well, here's another corrupt bargain for you. Basically, the North sews away the South in exchange for the presidency. The Reconstruction comes to a flaming end. Um, Hayes became president, and he's quickly going to order all federal troops to stop guarding the state houses in those last holdouts of Reconstruction governments in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, allowing the Democratic claimants to become governors and allowing complete Democratic, and in this case, and again, we're going to talk all about how the parties switch kind of, and they, they flip over the course of the 20th century, but at this point, when, when we talk about Southern white Democrats after the Civil War, this is the party of the white supremacists. This is the party of the Klan. Remember, the KKK was literally the military branch of the Democratic Party at this time. But again, please don't get confused. The Democrats back after the Civil War are not the same Democrats that we have today. They completely switch over. We'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, that was that was the bargain. Um, the North was sick and tired of spending all of its money and resources and manpower for all these soldiers to guard uh, the, the South under those five military districts. It just could not keep it out. It gets tired, it gets fatigued, um, and it gives up control of Reconstruction to the South. And when they gave up control to the South, regardless of whatever promises were made in this bargain, that is when this brief shining window of African Americans actually having their rights guaranteed ends. So for all intents and purposes, even though you'll still have African American officials um, in office up through like the 1890s, for all intents and purposes, reconstruction as a time period uh, when you had uh, civil rights being guaranteed is now over by 1877. So that is the end of reconstruction. When we talk in our next lecture, we will get into the next era in American history, which is called the Gilded Age. Um, if you're not familiar with the Gilded Age, let me refer you to Samuel Clements, who is probably somebody that you're not familiar with. So let me refer you to an author you might have heard of before with like Huckleberry Finn, a guy named Mark Twain. All right. With that being said, thank you guys so much. I will talk to you later.